Hello, I'm Barbara McLean, and I'm here today to introduce you to Quick Look Monitoring, an easy guide to invasive and non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring in today's critical care. So, very important to remember that no matter what tools you have for monitoring, no matter how well you're evaluating physiologic homeostasis or alterations, it really requires vigilance for us to actually interpret the data and to promptly respond to information that is delivered to us. Monitors help us to provide information and data points that tell us about the compensation and decompensation of our critical patients. So this is why we like to use monitoring and we use it in a wide variety of ways. So first of all, monitoring that doesn't require instrumentation, it just requires you, your eyes, your ears, your touch, to inspect your patient's skin and to evaluate whether or not there's normal capillary refill or what the skin temperature is at any given time. That can help us to understand if we suspect that there's abnormal blood flow in a region or in the systemic circulation. Secondly, palpation and just simple touch to actually see is the patient warm or cold or clammy? Are they diaphoretic? Do we look at their pulses and look at their pulses bilaterally? Are they equal? Are they bounding? Are they present? Are they absent? And to look at whether or not skeletal muscles are fasciculating, tremoring upon touch. And again, of course, we have the capability to percuss. We percuss the chest, we percuss the abdomen, and we look at whether or not there's tympanic sounds, which indicate to us the high presence of air. And auscultation of both the chest and the heart, utilizing our stethoscope and what's between the ears to actually evaluate the breath sounds and to look at whether or not there is paradoxical breathing or use of, of muscles that are not ordinarily muscles that we use in breathing. And are the heart sounds muffled? Are they loud? Are they bounding? Or are there murmurs present? All of that information does not require any catheter to be placed and should be part of our daily evaluation of our patient. The electrocardiogram also gives us significant information, as we've discussed before. The kind of information that tells us about cardiac dysrhythmias, the presence or absence of myocardial ischemia or infarction, and can also give us a bird's eye view to electrolyte changes, in particular related to potassium, which can delay conduction and prolong the PR interval, prolong the QRS, and prolong the QT. More on that later in the electrolyte chapter. So EKG is not a measurement, of course, of the mechanical response of the heart. It's not a measure of heart function, but it is a measurement of the process of electrical activity as it proceeds through the heart and as it relates to electrolyte balancing. So it's quite lovely and non-invasive. But when we need more specific monitoring in general in the ICU, more specific monitoring to help us understand perfusion, to actually assure that the therapies that we're giving to the patient are actually treating the endpoints of hemodynamics, blood flow, and oxygenation, and that help guide us when we have lost our perfusion endpoints. This will allow us to differentiate and to evaluate appropriately organ function and dysfunction and patients at risk. And for that more specific monitoring, we're gonna talk about invasive monitoring. So when we think about invasive monitoring, really important for our purposes here today, we're really talking about intravascular chamber monitoring. Now that's a lot different than intrafascial monitoring or intra-abdominal monitoring or even intracerebral monitoring. Intravascular monitoring means that we've placed our catheter inside of a blood-filled chamber the artery, the vein, or in the cardiac chambers, the right atria or the right ventricle. It's not the same process to prepare for this as it is when we use extravascular catheters or extravascular chambers, like intracranial pressure, abdominal pressure, or intrafascial pressure. When we monitor the venous, arterial, or cardiac chambers, the intravascular chambers, you must actually have a particular connection for that monitoring. First and foremost, 
a pressurized fluid bag pressurized to 300 millimeters of mercury, which maintains a continuous delivery of fluid through a transducer. That transducer is what is actually going to extrapolate the waveforms of the patient and portray them as a visual on your monitor and as a number on your monitor. At the transducer, we have a series of stopcocks. Those stopcocks, and, and frequently there's one, sometimes there's two, those stopcocks allow us to, to actually zero reference our transducer, and our transducer is held in a transducer holder. The transducer is also connected to pressure tubing. We're going to take a look at that in just one second. With extravascular chambers, you do not have pressurized fluid bags. That's the one thing that's different. The extravascular chamber has a closed fluid-filled tubing system, the pressure tubing system. That's a closed fluid system, not a continuous fluid system. A transducer, stopcocks, transducer holder, and of course, that closed fluid system, which is the pressure tubing, but no pressurized bag. So very important to appreciate the difference between intravascular pressure monitoring, requiring a pressurized fluid bag, for a dynamic column of fluid, and extravascular chamber monitoring, which actually does not allow you to have a pressurized fluid system, always pushing fluid through a transducer. Okay, so our focus today really is arteries and veins. Really important to remember the difference between arteries and veins. Arteries are thick and muscular, uh, they have the ability to aggressively mobilize blood flow in a pulsatile manner, and they have no valves to separate the blood flow. So blood flows along the artery through a gradient of pressure, and the arteries actually can vacillate. It's a narrow lumen with a lot of muscle, and the pressure measured in the artery is always pulsatile. So we look at two types of arteries. We look at the systemic artery in the critical care unit, systemic artery, and in special areas, in special units, and beyond what we'll talk about today, the pulmonary artery. Both are pulsatile. Then we think, and, and then we remind ourselves that in arterial pressure, that pressure is uh, relatively high because you have the push, which is systole, and the relaxation, which is diastole. Push, relax, push, relax, push, relax, push, relax. Arteries carry blood from the heart to the periphery and organs, and arteries carry blood from the right ventricle up into the lung. And the blood carried in the arteries is usually oxygenated, except in the pulmonary artery, which connects the right heart to the lung. Now, if we think about our veins, our veins have a much thinner wall, very significant reduction in muscle and elastic fibers. So really, your veins just respond to the amount of volume that's in them by di uh, dilating related to more volume, but not pulsing and not propelling blood. It has a very wide lumen, which allows a capability for storage of volume. Most of your volume is actually in your veins and there's no pulsatile quality, and there are valves all along the venous structure to prevent blood from going backwards and allowing it to flow down a pressure gradient to ultimately to the right ventricle. The purpose of your veins is to return blood to the heart from the periphery and organs and return blood from the lungs to the left heart. So the blood in the veins is relatively deoxygenated except for the pulmonary vein, which carries blood from the lung back to the left heart. That's oxygenated blood. So understanding the arteries and the veins gives us a good baseline for appreciating central venous cannulation and arterial cannulation, which is the purpose of this talk today. Okay, so last but not least, we want to talk about the components of intravascular monitoring. And the major components are, first and foremost, your transducer. A continuous pressurized system when we're talking about vascular chambers, that means a one liter bag of normal saline or a 500 cc bag of normal saline inside of a pressure bag that is appropriate to the volume. 
So a one liter pressure bag for one liter of volume or a 500 cc pressure bag for a 500 cc bag of volume. Proximal stopcock, a connection to the catheter via the pressure tubing, the stopcock, and a sampling port. And depending on your, uh, whether it's your venous catheter or whether it's your arterial catheter, will determine the sampling port that you will use. So from patient catheter, pressure tubing, stopcock, transducer. The transducer on the bottom has two connections that always point down. And those connections are your fluid line and your connection cable. So as we look at this information, what we'll see is facing downwards, always, 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 absolutely facing downward. The cable connector, which is known as the cable pigtail, and the pressure bag fluid connector, which is basic IV tubing. Facing up will be the pressure tubing that will connect to your patient. So here with our transducer holder, what you're seeing in to your far left is the arterial line denoted by the red and the pressure tubing going up, which then connects to the patient and the fluid tubing going down and the cable going down, which connects to your pressure monitor. Next to that, the blue line with the pressure tubing pointing up and the cable and the connection to your fluid tubing always pointing down, always, always, always. So when you look at your transducer, you should never have a problem figuring out which way it should slip into the holder. Pressure cable, fluid tubing down, pressure tubing up. Next to that, you see that yellow line, again, beyond what we'll talk about today, and that yellow line will connect to your PA catheter, and the same thing will be true, cable and fluid line down, pressure tubing up. Now, on each one of those transducers that you see right there, you see that you have a blue pigtail, that's what you pull the flush to actually open up a, a one-way valve that allows fluid to go from your pressure bag all the way through your pressure tubing, and you also see a stopcock. Now, one of my colleagues asked me to remind you about the stopcock. When your stopcock is turned even, as it is right here, straight across, when your stopcock is even, you are open to monitor from your patient to the transducer, and you are closed to zero, which means allowing air to enter into the transducer. So in general, at all times, at all times, your stopcock should be turned even because that's how you monitor your patient. But occasionally, you need to calibrate or what we call zero reference your transducer. When that occurs, what you're going to do is turn your stopcock up, which then shuts off monitoring and allows you to take the deadhead off of your port and allow the transducer to communicate with atmosphere. Now, atmospheric pressure, where we live today, is 760 millimeters of mercury. And that means any pressure your patient has above that is what we're going to measure. 760 equals zero. So again, stopcock up pointing towards the pressure tubing, stopcock up to open to atmosphere to zero reference your transducer. Stopcock even, so basically straight across, to close off the air and allow monitoring to occur. So I'm going to show you this in a basic setup in my home studio, which is not the hospital, in just a second. Good. So never, ever, ever turn your stopcock down. When you turn your stopcock down, you now have an open pathway of atmosphere to patient. So we never turn our stopcock down. Never, ever, ever. Good.
Now, zero referencing, as I've mentioned before, is what gives us a gold standard to know what our patient's pressure is in response to atmosphere. So if you have a systolic blood pressure of 120, that's 120 above 760. That would mean that if you were using 760, you would be reporting to your physician that your patient had a blood pressure of 120 plus 760, which would be 880, oh, enough to give everyone a stroke. So we basically call atmospheric pressure zero. And when we open our transducer to air, we're allowing the transducer to communicate with atmosphere and that calls that pressure zero. That's our reference point. That point is zero. So always remind ourselves that we zero reference because we need to start from a number that is acceptable. That will be zero, not 760. And you need to do this when you very first connect your transducer to your monitor at least once per shift, but you don't need to do it when you're changing the transducer position or when the patient changes, because if the transducer position changes with the patient, there's no reason for you to re-zero. So remember, you open the stopcock transducer to air by turning your stopcock up. I always, awkward for me. Turn your stopcock up towards the pressure tubing Take the deadhead off the stopcock and allow the transducer to see the atmosphere. Always close to the patient when you're doing this. So stopcock to the patient to allow you to open to air and therefore create zero. And you only monitor your patient. You don't turn your stopcock and leave it open. You don't twist your stopcock all around so you can drain and monitor with ICP, you always only monitor your patient, only monitor your patient. And in the case of intracranial pressure monitoring, which we are not talking about here, but when you are draining your patient's uh, cerebral spinal fluid, you only drain. And when you monitor, you only monitor. All right, the next step is to level because we have to have a point of reference in the human body that is close to atmospheric pressure. And that is typically the right and left atrium. Both right and left atrium at rest are at zero. And that means they are equal to atmospheric pressure. So we always wish to level our transducer to what we call the phlebostatic axis, the place where blood doesn't move at rest because it's equal to atmosphere. So typically we designate that as the fourth intercostal space uh, in the mid axillary level at one half the AP diameter. So a larger patient is gonna be a bigger half and in a smaller patient will be a smaller half. Fourth intercostal space at one half the AP diameter. Now I personally like to mark that reference point on the chest with a Sharpie, but you can use a skin tag so it will always be the same reference point. And again, it's only for the vascular pressures. So that means for your A-line, for your CVP, for your PA catheter. It's not the point of reference for ICP, intra-abdominal pressure, or intrafascial pressure, which of course, remember, are extravascular pressures. So, level and zero to maintain the integrity. Now, just a quick visual to remind us about where that phlebostatic axis is. And it's mostly a visual. Typically, we're going to use a laser light, a laser ruler, or we're going to use a carpenter's level with that little bubble in the center placed to the skin tag or the mark that has been measured before so that we are always leveling our transducer to the phlebostatic axis. And if we're going to do it the most correctly, we level the stopcock that opens to air to that fourth intercostal space, one half of the AP. That's the best way to do it. Some folks will say do it a little higher or a little lower, but the best way is the stopcock that you will open to allow air to communicate to your transducer. That's what gets level to that fourth intercostal space, one half the AP diameter of the chest. Now, once you're connected, you need to perform a square wave test. 
Now this is a little more intricate, but oh my goodness, so quintessentially important. This actually helps us to determine the integrity of our monitoring system from pressure bag to patient through the transducer. So we're going to put our monitor scale at 300 millimeters of mercury and then on our transducer, that little pigtail I showed you, we're going to pull that pigtail just for about two seconds. What that does when I pull that pigtail is it opens up my transducer to monitor 300 millimeters of mercury. So I'm going to achieve a square wave and the top of that square wave should be at 300 millimeters of mercury. If it's not at 300 millimeters of mercury, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that my pressure bag has been inflated to 300 millimeters of mercury and then I'm going to consider there might be some air in the tubing that I need to get rid of by flushing out my line. Now, I want to remind you no matter what the pressure is, you put your monitor scale to 300, you pull your pigtail for about two seconds and you get a square wave on the monitor. Now you need to freeze your waveform on your monitor so you can evaluate it. You're going to perform this at the time of setup. You should perform it at the beginning of each shift. You should also consider performing it after you've opened up the catheter system. And by the way, whenever the waveform of your pressure, either venous or arterial, seems unusual, seems smaller than it was before or bigger than it was before, you need to always do a square wave test. The square wave test is what tells you if the problem is your system. And if the problem is not your system, the problem is your patient. Now, you could consider, it's not necessarily my advice, but it typically is the protocol of your unit. Now you're going to consider doing a uh, non-invasive blood pressure measurement, but not until you've done the square wave test unless of course you think the patient is dying in front of you and then don't worry about any of that. All right, so this gives you a little visual of the square wave with what we call a dynamic flush, pulling your pigtail. And you can see that big square and in a 300 millimeter uh, signal window, you see that the top of the square is at 300 millimeters of mercury. And after that, you see some oscillations. And those oscillations are very, very important. So big square and then a few little bumps afterwards, which are not physiologic. They're too narrow to be a patient event. Those are just oscillations of the transducer in response to the dynamic flush. So let's look at that a little bit more concisely. Okay, so right in the center, you'll see here a normal waveform and a normal square wave test. So I've set my scale on my bedside monitor to 300 millimeters of mercury and my pressure bag is at 300 millimeters of mercury. Should not be more than that. You shouldn't have half of the green line showing just to 300 millimeters of mercury. The top of the square, number one, is at 300 millimeters of mercury and then there's a deceleration. Typically you see two decelerations, the first one half of the square and the second one half of the first one. That tells you that you have an appropriate square wave test. And then we have two issues. We have issues known as overdamping and issues known as underdamping. Underdamping means that the signal is hyper responsive. It's very exaggerated. It has a very thin, sharp point. I saw somebody last week in CVICU with an underdamped signal. And it's a lot of oscillation with the patient's arterial pressure. And you're trying to figure out what the heck's going on. Systolic is extraordinarily high and diastolic is very low. This typically occurs because you've added extension tubing to your pressure monitoring kit. So your tubing is too long. It also may occur because there's very small air bubbles in your system. So flush, 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 take off your extender tubing and do a square wave test again. So you can see here your square wave was above 300 and you had lots of oscillations. Plus you have on this signal, you can see to the left, a normal A line. Then you have the three abnormal A line pressures in blue and then the square wave test. So if I have 
checked my bag. It's at 300, not above, not below. But there are small air bubbles in the system that I might not be able to see, but I'm doing a nice flush of my system. I take off any extra tubing and I still have this visual. My transducer isn't working and I need to change my transducer system. Okay. Over damp means that my waveform looks really sluggish. It looks really small. Could be confused or actually could be hypotension. Could also be confused as a poor A-line position and that might be true as well. But the easy things for me to look at is when I see a sluggish waveform. So again, down here on the overdam side, you see the normal A-line pressure, and then after that, the, the three small ones in blue. So that's sluggish. It's rounded. I don't really have a dichrotic notch, and it's a very blunted, compressed appearance. Systolic is usually quite low. The diastolic is quite high. There's not much difference between the two. The number one cause of this, number one, is that you have very large air bubbles in your system. So flush, 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 flush. Then I want you to be sure that the tubing that you've attached from transducer to patient, that comes in a kit, so very hard to misplace this or misdo it, but that tubing should be hard. Pressure tubing is hard because it's an extension of the pressure wave from the patient to the transducer. That's a very important the other thing is a lot of times when these kits come out of the box, all their connections aren't tight. So make sure every connection is tight and that you're not losing visualization of the waveform. And then always consider that your fluid, your pressurized fluid bag might be less than 300. So start, if your patient looks okay, if everything seems okay with the patient, he's eating lunch, he's awake and he's alert, nothing's changed. His pulsatile signal looks good. His heart rate looks good. It's probably the system. If your heart rate has gone up or down, your pulse ox is uh, decreasing, your pulsatile signal is poor, it's probably not your system. It's probably your patient. So always look at your patient first and then consider your system second. And don't accept these terrible signals. Most of the time, terrible signals with patients who have a reasonable blood pressure are a problem of your system. So remember, always do a square wave test, always check your connections, check your pressure bag, check your tubing, make sure there's no air anywhere in your system. That will help you have a better pressure waveform visualization. All right, so just remind yourself, troubleshooting, most important, a damped waveform looks like hypotension. So always make sure your patient is okay and then check your system, just as I've mentioned before. And another thing that's really important is if I look at my monitor and the numbers appear normal, but the waveform appears tiny or large, or I can't even see it, I probably have the wrong scale on my monitor. So ask one of your preceptors or your colleagues to show you how to change the scale on your bedside monitor. Okay. Now the other thing is if I can't obtain a zero waveform, something is wrong with the stopcock positioning. Remember, off to the patient, open to atmosphere. And also make sure all your connections between the cable and the monitor, the transducer pigtail, the cable and the monitor, make sure those are all tight and appropriate. All righty then. Now let's apply that to a central venous catheter. And the central venous catheter in critical care is used so that we can uh, uh, administer vasoactive substances that need to mix in a large blood pool. That's why we use central venous catheters so that we won't cause terrible dyscrasia by uh, giving very toxic agents that can cause necrotizing of tissue if they're given in small chambers. That's why we put it into the large blood pool for our vasoactive drugs but also allows us from the distal tip, which is typically brown, the distal tip to continuously monitor the pressure in the central vein, which reflects the right atria, which reflects the right ventricle. Now in patients who have advanced CV disease and loss of compliance, we're always gonna expect that central venous pressure will be high. But it is a really important consideration that we're also gonna look at whether our patient responds to fluid by 
actually tracking and following what happens to central venous pressure when we give fluid. All right, so very good. So now we just take a look at this beautiful hand drawing on top of an x-ray to show you where your central venous catheter should sit. And it should sit either inside the yellow circle or with the distal tip into the right atrium. Now normal central venous pressure monitoring with just a central venous catheter reflects the pressure at the junction of the vena cava and the right atria. And to remind ourselves that the purpose of the vein is to fill the right atria and the purpose of the right atria is to fill the right ventricle. So you're doing a distal, uh, a distant monitoring of right ventricular pressure. Central venous pressure provides an estimate of intravascular blood volume, but it is profoundly, profoundly affected by right ventricular and tricuspid valve compliance. So when people use the term preload, they usually mean volume, but true preload pressure is about volume and the compliance of the chamber being filled. So with somebody who has uh, right ventricular hypertrophy, I'll have a very high CVP pressure, even though they may have a very low volume status. So we don't really look at one number in CVP, we look at the continuous trends. We like to measure CVP at the end of expiration, which means you have to understand what the pressure is in the thoracic cage at end expiration. If you're breathing spontaneously, that's positive. If you're breathing with a ventilator, expiratory pressure is negative or more negative. And we always want to remember that we're going to zero at the mid-axillary line. So now we take a look at a patient's central venous pressure. Now that may look pulsatile to you, but it is just variation related to atrial contraction, valvular close, and valvular bulge. Atrial contraction, valvular close, valvular bulge, all reflected in the column of blood in the central vein. And you know it's not pulsatile because take a look at that scale. That scale is 0 to 20, and that pressure is at around 8 uh, millimeters of mercury. It's a very small pressure with some small variations reflecting the process of ventricular filling and valvular mobility. So, as I mentioned to you before, central venous pressure re reflects the right heart response to volume and is affected by changes in right-sided compliance, valvular function, and the effects of breathing on the right ventricle. Now the normal central venous pressure of you and I is typically two to eight millimeters of mercury. We're breathing spontaneously and I could get four liters of fluid without making my CVP go up because I have a nice compliant right ventricle which says, give me volume buddy, no high pressures, give me volume. But the loss of compliance of the right ventricle causes the pressure to be measured at a higher level. And in this visual, what I'm showing you here is inspiratory positive pressure. So when the patient gets a breath from the ventilator with positive pressure, and that's going to be true whether it's SIMV with pressure support or cyst control, the central venous pressure is thrust upwards. But I want to look at true central venous pressure unaffected by breathing. So in this case, with positive pressure breathing, I'm going to look at the lower pressure, and that's the expiratory pressure. Now, sometimes people will call that peak and valley, and I'll refer to that again in just a moment, but I really just want you to appreciate positive pressure when I'm taking a vent breath and decreased pressure when I'm exhaling. That's when I'm on a ventilator or breathing with positive pressure. Spontaneous breathers, they have positive pressure um, when they exhale and negative pressure when they inhale. So the pressure goes down when they inhale and comes back up when they exhale. Completely opposite, paradoxical. And to remember, again, I talked a little bit about the variations of your central venous pressure well beyond what we need to, to know today. But what we do want to understand is your atria contracts. That gives you a little pressure up, upbeat. That's called the A wave. The tricuspid valve closes. That gives me a little pressure increase. That's called the C wave and the V wave. So I'm not going to talk about X and Y descent here, just the V wave. The V wave is a little pressure increase in the atria as the ventricle is contracting and the valve moves up into the atria. 
A wave, A wave, C wave, V wave, A wave, C wave, V wave. I see that all on my central venous catheter. It shouldn't be a straight line, but it has very small variabilities. Atrial contraction, closure of the valve, valvular bulge. For anything more than that, you need to come to an advanced hemodynamics class and you're all invited anytime. Okay, so again, as said before, normal right atrial pressure, two to six millimeters of mercury. The A wave represents atrial contraction and it is the most significant component of your CVP. We'd love to be able to look at the A wave at the top of the A wave and the bottom of the A wave, but in general, we're just gonna look at the CVP and we're gonna measure that, remember, in the valley for the patient who is on a ventilator, on SINV with pressure support or cyst control or BiPAP, and in the peak for a patient who is breathing spontaneously, but they can't even be getting pressure support, no positive pressure at all, then you read CVP in the peak. Okay, excellent. So now we take a look at one of our patients and you can see here that his CVP is 11. And you can see he has a fair amount of variability and that variability is actually because he has a relatively non-compliant right ventricle. But what we're generally gonna do is look at the top and the bottom and get the average. That's what your monitor does and that's what your monitor is displaying. That the average between the consistent top central venous pressure and the consistent bottom central venous pressure, that average is 11. So that's what we're gonna call this patient's CVP. Excellent. Now we like the CVP, we like that central catheter because it's easy, it's an easy setup. If we go through the right IJ, it's a pretty easy catheterization. It's really great for medication, but keep that distal lumen as much as you can open and only for monitoring, if it's possible. That's the last place you wanna add anything and if you do add anything to be administered through the distal lumen, which is typically the brown one, if you're going to give anything, have it be intermittent medications, not constant medications, because you're going to have to flush that central catheter, and you don't want to be bolusing patients with norepi and epi and fentanyl and propofol. So try to leave it for your intermittent medications, blood administration, other things like so. The disadvantages, of course, with the central catheter is that it doesn't really tell you what the right atrial pressure is or what the right ventricular pressure is. It's an indirect measure. And of course, there are complications. Most importantly, central line infection. We can, of course, avoid that if we treat this aseptically. And if we always are aware that this catheter lies right next to your right atrium and there's so much potential for infection. But you can also thrombose that catheter, which means you have to be sure that you are always running fluids. And remember, pressurized solution is consistently running fluid through the transducer at around three mLs per hour to keep that line open and under pressure to keep that line open. There are complications on insertion and the one that's most common is pneumothorax. So be aware after central line placement of all the signs and symptoms of pneumothorax, most particularly bradycardia, asynchronous chest expansion, and reduction or absence of breath sounds on one side. Patient will become hypotensive and the peak inspiratory pressure of your ventilator will be going off because the lung has been now compressed by the presence of air in that uh, the, the, peric uh, the pleural cavity. Okay, no electrical shock is going to occur in today's world. That does, doesn't happen. This is all grounded now. All right, so always be aware of acute changes in your CVP in either direction. So your patient's been floating along all day between 8 and 11, and all of a sudden they're 2. Okay, now their pressure now is 2. So that may reflect significant hypovolemia. Your patient may be going into hypovolemic shock. They may have very low pressure associated with that hypovolemia. They've had a trauma, they're losing blood, they're dehydrated, they've lost a lot of fluid from their drains, they've lost fluid through their burns, their third spacing, and they are arterially and venous hypovolemic. So be aware, with decreased CVP, it might be a problem. Or it might be the end result of something you've been doing, diuresing, uh, renal replacement therapy. So always just be aware 
and make sure that you are discussing this with your providers. Now, if my patient has tachycardia in response to hypovolemia, the CVP will become falsely elevated. So now my patient who is bleeding or hypovolemic may have a CVP of 11, but actually if I could reduce his heart rate, which I'm not gonna do because that's compensatory, but if I could reduce his heart rate, his CVP might be one. It might be zero. It might even be negative zero because remember the right atria in rest is at zero, meaning equal to atmospheric pressure. And if there's no volume, the pressure in the right atria could drop below zero. So we are very, very concerned about low CVPs. Increased CVPs occur, of course, whenever your patient has tachycardia, you're gonna have an increased CVP. With tricuspid stenosis or regurg, with RV dysfunction, loss of RV compliance, pulmonary hypertensive states, pulmonic stenosis, pulmonary embolism, ooh, your CVP will go up. Cardiac tamponade, ooh, your CVP will go up. And when you're in AV dissociation, because you don't have synchrony, the atria becomes fuller, 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 fuller of volume and CVP goes up. So just be aware. You may not always be able to diagnose the problem. That's okay, nobody's asking you to diagnose. What we're asking you to do is recognize that your CVP has dropped or your CVP has gone up and to make sure that you have a discussion with your providers or with an expert critical care nurse to help you determine what's occurring for your patient. And again, I always want to remind you above everything else because you'll hear your doc say it and you want to pay attention. CVP is not a volume number. CVP is most particularly affected by alterations in ventricular compliance. And we want to remind ourselves that the right ventricle is normally very distendable. The right atria is normally very distendable. But if I have hypertrophy, if I have heart failure, if I have MI, if I have obstructive cardiomyopathy, if I have a rapid heart rate, a pulmonary embolism, or I'm on positive pressure ventilation, CVP is gonna go up because the compliance of my right side heart, right atrium, right ventricle is decreased. So in those patients, very small changes in volume will produce very large changes in pressure. I wanna know if you have a right ventricular compliance problem, I give you fluid and watch your CVP go up. That's not normal. Your CVP shouldn't go up from small amounts of fluid. Cool, very good. So now let's talk about the arterial catheter in critical care. Arterial line placement is preferred in unstable patients because A, it's accurate. It's about blood flow, not blood vessel sound. Blood flow, it's accurate and it's continuous. All right. So why do we actually place an A-line? One of the most common reasons is frequent requirements for ABGs or lots of labs, but really important is to place an A-line with any patient who has a low blood flow state. Hypotension, hypovolemia, septic shock, COVID shock, cardiogenic shock, low blood flow states. In patients with severe hypertension, because it may be much more meaningful to look at their blood flow dynamic than the actual sound of the artery rebounding under an occlusive cuff. In any patient who has severe vasoconstriction or severe vasodilation, those are gonna be really important concepts. And in patients on vasopressors, vasodilators, or inotropes, they all should have an A-line if possible. Now remember what that arterial catheter is gonna allow you to do is measure constant arterial pressure and flow. And in the ICU today, you can also make a connection that allows you to, to directly or indirectly measure left ventricular stroke volume. Hallelujah. Stroke volume, the amount of blood ejected by the left heart on every beat. Hallelujah, the ability to measure that. So this is what basically our A-line looks like. It's typically placed in the radial artery after some testing has been done to make sure that the other artery, the ulnar artery, which is the one that is on the pinky side, can actually perfuse the hand. That's called the Allen test. And what we wanna remind ourselves about when we place that A-line, sorry, I pushed the wrong button, is that that arterial catheter is residing in an artery and that the potential, if there was a disconnection, is that our patient could bleed to death. So we pay particular attention to how tight those connections are and we also remember 
that the artery delivers blood into the hand. If we're in the, if we're in the radial artery or the brachial artery or the femoral artery, the radial or brachial artery delivers blood into the hand. It's a very small pool of blood. No medication in the ICU. No medication allowed in the artery. No medication allowed in the artery. Rarely, you may have a cardiologist that might want to give something into the artery to stop vasospasming, and that is their decision, but you don't do it. You do not give medication into the artery, not the pulmonary artery and not the systemic artery. Let me repeat myself. Do not give medication into an arterial line, ever. You do not ever give medication here. You are always aware that these connections must be tight because the arterial pressure of the patient, if a connection is loose, the patient can bleed to death. That's not going to happen on your shift and hopefully never. Now when we have an arterial pressure line, what we're going to see on our bedside monitor are multiple things. So first we're going to talk about the systolic pressure, which is the response of the artery to the LV ejection. So when the LV boluses blood out on contraction, pushes out that blood out into the aorta, the peak of the systolic pressure is a reflection of LV ejection. And we'd like to see that pressure typically above 90 and below 180, typically. There are going to be some times when that's going to be okay, below 90 or above 180, but those are particular circumstance. And then we move to the diastolic pressure, which is that low point. The diastolic pressure is a reflector of vascular tone. And remember, our arteries need to have good tone to mobilize the blood flow along the arterial bed to ultimately deliver it into the capillaries. So diastolic pressure actually reflects the runoff volume as it goes out to the capillaries to perfuse your cells and organs. And typically, we would like to see that diastolic pressure greater than 45. And the difference between the two is known as pulse pressure. So systole minus diastole is very primitive as a reflection for stroke volume. So I just have an A-line. I can look at systole minus diastole and correlate that, trend that with stroke volume. And normal pulse pressure, not stroke volume, normal pulse pressure, 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. So let's take a little closer look here. All right. So systolic arterial pressure is reflecting left ventricular work. And we're talking about the systemic artery. So that systolic pressure reflects the active force of the bolus of blood out into the artery. And it is reflecting, number one, the amount of volume, and number two, the amount of resistance. So when I use a volume bolus, I expect systolic pressure to go up. When I put my patient on vasopressors, I expect the systolic pressure to go up. If I put you on a basal pressure and your systolic pressure goes down, that might be telling me that I've limited your left ventricular ejection. So I just want to pay attention to that when I'm evaluating my patient. Diastolic pressure reflects vascular tone. So the diastolic pressure is that low pressure just before systole, and that's actually reflecting the continuous passive flow of blood to the capillaries that was generated with the bolus, the systole. Systole, diastole, which is constant and continuous. And it is most significantly reflective of the state of your vascular tone or your vascular resistance. That's why we love to look at blood pressure. Ejection and tone. Ejection and tone. Ejection and tone. Mean arterial pressure is a calculated measure between peak systole and diastole and reminding ourselves with a normal heart rate, diastole lasts twice as long as systole. So diastole affects the mean arterial pressure more significantly. And what that MAP pressure tells us is the close approximation of the continuous pressure flow of blood maintaining capillary perfusion. And it represents that whole pressure during the entire cardiac arterial cycle. And in our practice, we want that above 65, sometimes higher, but above 65 in order to maintain 
major organ perfusion. So typically we like to see mean arterial pressure greater than 65. Now on the arterial pressure, on, on the arterial pressure on your monitor, we always look for the dichrotic notch. That is a small notch that occurs between peak systole and the beginning of diastole, and it reflects the difference in systolic and diastolic pressure by the notch, which indicates the closure of the aortic valve, okay? So my aortic valve is in the aorta, left ventricle boluses, 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 blood out, pressure in the aorta rises, pressure in the ventricle goes down, the valve closes. That's the dichrotic notch, and that is the beginning of diastole. So for those of us who are in CVICU and we talk about a balloon pump, we always want to time that to the dichrotic notch, which signifies the closure of the aortic valve and the beginning of the diastolic cycle of the cardiac, uh, the cardiac cycling. So let's remember about pulse pressure, 30 to 40, 35 to 40, 30 to 40. If you have a decreasing pulse pressure with tachycardia, that is an early sign of inadequate circulating blood volume. Pay attention before your patient has refractory metabolic acidosis and organ dysfunction. Increasing pulse pressure, so wider pulse pressure, and that's happening before your eyes. And we're not talking about somebody with essential hypertension or uh, neuro ICP failure. We're talking about your critical patient with sepsis and cardiogenic shock and hypovolemia. Increasing pulse pressure greater than 35 with tachycardia usually indicates there's a failure of oxygen utilization at the cellular level. So your compensatory mechanism is to provide more stroke volume at a faster heart rate, but it doesn't make the patient better. Both of these situations, decreasing pulse pressure with tachycardia, increasing pulse pressure with tachycardia, both of these situations require a view of metabolic acidosis. So blood gas or chemistry doesn't matter. Looking for the presence of metabolic acidosis because that's going to inform you very significantly. So just remind yourself, pulse pressure loosely predicts stroke volume. Systolic pressure minus diastolic pressure loosely predicts and reflects your stroke volume. So we can use just our basic A-line, even if we don't have an attachment that interprets the postatile wave. We can use our arterial catheter and our arterial line to tell us about the state of the left ventricle. Hallelujah, we've been looking for that for such a long time. Now, now we look at our arterial waveform on the monitor. If the numbers look light, but the picture looks smaller or is absent, always check the scale. And you can see the scale is circled here. This is a scale, I believe it's hard for me to see and I can't remember, but I think it's 180. The scale is zero to 180. And this is a normal scale that we use for arterial pressure. But if somebody put it up to 300 for the square wave test and didn't come back down, your waveform will be small. The numbers look normal, but the waveform is small. Remember also to look at your pressure bag, make sure that the pressure bag is inflated, make sure your stopcocks are turned the right way, make sure all your connections are tight, and make sure that there's no air in the system. But before you do any of that, make sure your patient's okay. If the numbers are right and the waveform looks wrong, then that's a system problem, not a patient problem. Beautiful, that sounds so great. And here's another picture of the arterial line correlated to the EKG to just remind you, QRS, electrical activation of the heart, causes mechanical contraction. So your systolic wave uh, in your arterial line actually occurs after you have electrically conducted and mechanically contracted your ventricle. Very straightforward, really lovely. And what's always very important for us to remember is that what you're looking at here is the left heart pressure to the far left and the bolus of blood out into the artery, which is in the middle, and that the mean arterial pressure is what pushes your blood all the way through the capillaries, all the way through your veins to the terminal point of the right atria. So mean arterial pressure must overcome your CVP.
As CVP gets higher, MAP must get higher in order to maintain perfusion from LV to RA. And that's what you're looking at here in this simple flow diagram. LV pressure overcomes the aortic resistance and arterial resistance, boluses blood out into the artery. That mean arterial pressure maintains the perfusion all the way through your capillaries, all the way through your veins, all the way back to your right heart. So paying attention to your CVP and your MAP and your arterial pressure almost tells you everything you need to know about your blood flow dynamics at your patient. Now that's going to be further enhanced by the attachment of a special transducer that actually projects stroke volume beyond our course today and also by excellent evaluation of your chemistry profile and your blood gas profile. Also beyond today but is part of this series. So I welcome you to enjoy me there or to joy in me and hopefully enjoy me but joy in me there in those discussions. Now we remind ourselves about the benefits of arterial catheterization, direct measured blood pressure and blood flow. And to remember that hypotension that does not have a system issue, pressure bag, transducer connection, air bubble, hypotension is always pathologic. And I can see it so much sooner if I'm monitoring it continuously if I've set my alarm limits appropriately, if I'm always evaluating that arterial pressure and that it will give me so much more information about your pulse, to pulse variation, your stroke volume and your stroke volume variation. And remember that invasive pressure is always more accurate as long as we make sure the system is good and the catheter is in the right position and doesn't have a thrombus. So it's all about that system in order to make sure that I have a good waveform. And remember that whenever I see a small waveform and I'm in the right scale, so remember, small waveform, look at your patient first, heart rate, pulse, ox, pleth. Then I look at my system and I make sure that I'm in the right scale for the blood pressure on my bedside monitor. All my connections are tight, nowhere in the system, stopcocks in the right direction, 300 millimeters of uh, pressure on my pressure bag, and a partridge in a pear tree. I felt like I was singing the 12 days of Christmas and it really is the 12 moments of arterial cannulation and arterial catheterization. It's easy to set up for an A-line. It's easy to place an A-line. It gives us real-time blood pressure monitoring, beat to beat waveform display, regular sampling of blood for lab tests and arterial gas. But yet again, by the way, it's invasive. It is a pathway for infection, so we should treat it aseptically as best we can, just like we treat a central line. There is always a risk of through and through injury of the artery and a hematoma, a pseudoaneurysm, distal ischemia because my other artery does not actually secure good perfusion, and now I've got a clot on my radial and my ulnar cannot perfuse the hand, so I can have very significant distal ischemia, which I should always be paying attention to. And again, Remember, it's an invasive line, so there's always a risk for infection. So, thank you so much for joining me today in Quick Look Monitoring. I hope to see you in our next series as we move forward to blood gases, ventilation, cardiac, and hemodynamic instability in the shock states. Thank you very much. Ta-ta for now.